Hello. Let's see. You should see the desktop now. And you should hear me. Does this seem okay? Do you, can it, do you hear me and see the desktop? Okay, great. All right. Let me pop up a couple more windows. Okay. Um, okay. Today we're going to finish talking about arrays and methods. And so after Thanksgiving break, we'll start talking about objects and classes. So this reading assignment is still sitting there. We haven't started it yet. So we'll start that. We'll, we'll finish. We're going to finish this example. This example here. We started it. We're going to finish it today. Okay. And then we'll start the stuff about classes next week. Okay. So this week is Thanksgiving. So we only meet today. We, we won't meet again until a week from today. Okay. Oh, and um, you should see your exam one scores now. Okay. So uh, I, I put them up. I posted them last night. Uh, if you have questions about your exam one scores, you know, send me an email or arrange a meeting. Like I said before, try to make sure that you look at not just your score, but also at the, the exam itself. Because it's the exam itself where I'm, I put uh, the number of points you got for each problem, any comments about uh, how, how the problem was supposed to have been done. So if you have questions about any of those comments or questions about the, the, the uh, number of points you got for each problem or how problems are supposed to be done, any kind of question at all, you know, send me an email or arrange a meeting. So please look at your exam one scores. And also your, uh, a, a few days ago, you should have also got the homework three scores also. And the same, uh, look at anything, you know, look at the comments about the, we don't mark up the um, programming assignments. We don't have a way to mark up your code for the programming assignments. So that that's kind of, unlike the exams, there isn't a convenient way to, to, to add comments to your code. So there are some comments typed into the feedback uh, box, but those are kind of vague. You know, those comments can be kind of vague. It's a little bit hard to, to make comments about code. But if you do have questions about the comments or if you have questions about your, your score, you know, please send me an email. So look up, look into your assignment, your program assignment three result and your exam one result. Okay. All right. So um, we want to talk more about this example here. But I updated, I have it on my computer. I haven't put it up on the website yet. I, I added another method to this library. So instead of looking at this one, let's look at the one I have on my hard drive and then I'll put it, I'll put it up on the course website after class. So I've updated this method. I'll, I'll show you what, what I updated. Let me start Dr. Java. Okay, here's this collection of array methods. Um, I added another one of these ink array methods. We started talking about those. I added another one. So we'll go back over these. There's now four methods that more or less do the same thing, but they show you different ways that people approach these uh, array ideas. So the, the, the four different methods all essentially accomplish the same thing. They take an array as an input, and add one to every element of the array. But they 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 choose to do it in quite different ways. And in the in the real world of Java programming, you see people using pretty much all four of these. They they all four are done. Sometimes one is better, sometimes one is more useful than the other. Okay. So let's look at the, these. What I want to do is I'm going to take uh I want to put them up on Java Visualizer. But I can't put the whole thing on the Java visualizer. So I'm just going to take these four methods that increment arrays. So I'm going to take these four and go to the Java visualizer. Okay. And I want to just look at these four methods that are called ink array for now. We'll go back and look at some of the others. So there's four methods that have ink array in their name. Okay. And I want to look at what the 
why are there four of these things? Well, I look at why there are four of them. And I need to delete these two methods here that we're not interested in right now. And replace them with a main method. The main method so we can call the ink methods and then watch how they perform. Okay, now, this one's named ink array in place because it takes this input array and just makes the changes right in the array that it's given. Okay, so right in the array we're given, we make the changes in that array. Okay, so that's what we mean by in place. This input array, now the, the function returns void, so it doesn't actually return anything because the result is sitting in that matrix and in that uh, array there. This one takes in an input array, but doesn't want to change it. It creates a new array and returns that array. So the answers are in the returned array. So we end up with two, two arrays. We'll have one array as the input, and then there'll turn out to be a second array that's the output. Okay. And the advantage here is that we don't change this array if suppose we want to keep the old numbers okay we don't do it this way we don't change that array whereas this one we lose the old numbers and we replace them with new numbers in that array and we'll see uh, in a minute we'll see like why you want both of these what yeah one of them one of them this one changes the numbers in the array this one doesn't and instead it creates a second array okay. now this third one is the new one i added okay this one kind of looks like the second one. See, it takes in an input array and gives us out an output array. But we'll see in a minute that it doesn't create a second array. This one took in an input array and created a second array to hold the output. This one's actually gonna act like the in-place one. It's gonna take this input array, make the changes in it, and then we'll see that it's gonna return another reference to its that same array. We'll see in, we'll, when we draw the pictures, you'll see what it's doing. But it's going to actually do the same thing the ink array in place did. It's going to change that array, but then return a reference to it. And we'll see why it would do that. And it has to do with this hint, the word chain here. It has to do with something with the word chain there. Okay. Then this fourth one takes in two arrays. One array is the input array, it holds the numbers we want. And then the other array, it's gonna actually treat it as an output array. It's gonna copy the numbers from this array into that array, adding one to them. And then, so the input is there and the output is there, but there, but there's the, 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 the method takes both arrays as inputs, but it reads one and writes the other. So it only reads this one and it writes to that one. And then the output here is going to be actually an error code. We'll see why there would be an error code. So there's four very different ways of doing things. Notice a void, a, a void method, which doesn't return anything. A method that returns an array, but it's returning a new array. A method that returns an array, but it's returning a reference to an old array, not creating a new array and then one that returns an error code, okay? And, and it might seem confusing to have so many different ways to do the same thing, but these actually represent different styles of doing programming, and each style has its advantages and disadvantages, okay? These, these four different ways of treating an array as an input to a method, they pretty much appear all over the place. And, and it's just, um, for one thing, it's good practice in our thinking to understand how these four work. So what we're gonna be doing is practicing thinking of objects versus references. Okay, we, we keep having to, uh, I keep pointing out that you have to think of objects and references as different things. You have to keep thinking that some, that we have objects in the, in the right-hand side. When we draw pictures, the objects are in the right-hand side of the picture. The variables are in the left-hand side of the picture. The variables refer to the objects. And we have to be very careful to keep track of references versus objects. And understanding these really kind of pushes us 
to understand references versus objects. Okay, so let's play around with them. So I'm going to start by just creating a array to, to use as my something I want to use as the input array. So I'll say uh, double D. So uh, well, I'll call it A. Array A, which is an array of doubles, equals new double. Well, actually, I'm going to do is I'm going to create I'm going to put numbers in the array when I create. Instead of using new, I'm going to go ahead and put numbers in the array as I when I create it. Okay. So there's an array with one, two, three, four, five numbers in it. Now, remember, I'm doing three things here. Real important, I'm doing three things. I'm creating an array object. I'm creating an array reference variable, and I'm making the reference variable point at the object. And we can just stop and visualize that. And it's real important to remember, because that's what's gonna, that's how we're gonna understand the differences between these, is constantly thinking in terms of three things the array object, the array reference variable, and the reference from the variable to the object. So you can see in this picture, three things. That's a thing. This box over here is a thing. And the arrow is a thing, okay? The one thing is created by the right-hand side of the equal sign. It creates the object thing. The left-hand side of the equal sign creates the reference variable thing and the equal sign is the one that says put an arrow from here to there okay now as a let's con let's compare that to a couple other lines of code before we do call the met before playing with the method think about a couple other lines of code i could write okay okay so Okay. Let's go through, like we just said this thing does, why is it? Okay, this one does three, this line 12 does three things. Okay, creates the object, creates the reference variable, and then makes the reference variable point at the object. I claim that this line here, does two things. Okay, what do you think it does? Stop and think. Why would I say that line only does two things? What are the two things? Can we see what's at least one thing it does? Like if you think of from the line above, What's one thing it does that is also done in the line above? Creates the object. No. Like, okay, like if it creates an object, you have to show me what, remember, like up here, I said that creates the object, right? Right? Now, does that create an object? No, you're, uh, uh renaming a b yeah so so what does this line do what two what two things does this line do when i say it does two things okay remember this created an object this created a reference variable this put an arrow from the reference variable to the object what can you say down here? It 
Is there any part of that line that overlaps with the line above it? Is it creating a new variable? Yeah, and then that part pointing to what it's referencing. OK, well, OK, that part's there. There's creating a variable. So that's one thing it does. And it's pointing it to the same object A does. OK, now that's this thing that puts an arrow in that variable, right? So like the, this creates a reference variable and this puts an arrow in it. This creates a reference variable and this puts an arrow in it. What's different is on the right hand side. This one created an object. What is this one doing? What's it doing on the right hand side? How would you read that right hand side? Go ahead and visualize it. Oh, I forgot to, I don't want that yet. Okay. Create the reference variable, create the object, put an arrow from the reference variable to the object. Okay, now here's what this line's gonna do. Okay, why did I say it only did two things? Because it creates a variable B and points to the object. Yeah. It, it, named a. Yeah. It 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 used the it it's reusing this object. So it doesn't create an object. It does create a new reference variable. There's the new reference variable. Ah. And it did create a new arrow. There's the new arrow, but it didn't create a new object. Okay. So if you go back a step, you see that you know we this step created three things a reference variable a object and an arrow from the reference variable to the object the next line only did two things because it created a reference variable and an arrow to a previous object okay tell me what line 14 does nothing no 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 it does something very much it does something very 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 much does something it creates an object no it, it creates a variable yeah okay this part here looks just like the previous two lines so that's that it that does the same thing that that one did and that one did it creates a new reference variable so this line definitely creates a reference variable so it does that much. What else does it do? It points to nothing. Uh, that's not a good way to put it. What's a better way to say it? Would it be like the variable references nothing? No, it puts a better way to say it, it puts the ver it puts the specific value null in the reference variable. It puts null in the reference variable, which replaces the arrow. So it doesn't put an arrow in the reference variable, it puts null. Null is a very special thing in Java. So you it's not nothing. Yeah, you know, it's the thing called null. Just like zero is not nothing, zero is the number zero. The number zero tends to represent nothing, but not always. Sometimes the number zero can represent all kinds of different things. But zero is a number, null is a value. It's not nothing, it is a value. It's a value that doesn't represent an arrow. So there's no arrow there yet. So the reference variable C doesn't point at an object. So the reference variable A points at an object, the reference variable B points at an object, the reference variable C does not point at an object. It holds null, but null is a very specific value, okay? And it, it's an important Java value. It has an important role to play in Java. So C holds something. C, does, you can't say that C holds nothing. 
C holds the thing called null. The thing called null is a placeholder saying there's no arrow here. Okay, it's saying that this it's a placeholder that represents the fact that there is no arrow in there. Okay, so I would say that this line does two things. It creates a reference variable and puts null in the reference variable. Okay. What does line 15 do? Creates variable D and put 27.9 in it. Yeah, because it's a it's a what kind of ref, what kind of variable is it? Primitive. A primitive variable. It doesn't hold arrows, it holds values. It primitive variables actually hold their value. So the number goes into that primitive variable. Unlike over here, where the primitive variable is the reference variable always holds either an arrow or null. Reference variables either hold arrows or they hold null. Notice that this line put the null in the reference variable a little bit like this line put the 27.9 right into D. But these two lines here and here put an arrow into the reference variable. Okay, so this one we would say does two things. Because it created a reference variable and put null in it. And this one does two things also. It created a primitive variable and put a value in it. Okay, so all three of these only did two things. They created their variable. See, that declares a variable. So that creates a new variable in the picture. You know, that creates new variables. And then this put an arrow in that variable. This put null in that variable. This put the value in that variable. This one created a variable, but it put an arrow to, it also had to create an object and then put an arrow to that object into the variable. Okay, so this one created the object. I could even put another one in here. I could do, let's see. This one's gonna be like the first one. What three things does that do? What three things does that do? It's just like 12, but it's almost exactly like line 12. It creates a new new object and then it creates a new variable and then uh, E points to the object. Puts an arrow in the variable. What, what, what's, there's only one subtle difference between this line and this line. They both do three things. They create an object, create a variable and point the variable at the object. What's the, what's the real, what difference is there between this one and this one? The array length and then their values. Yeah. Okay. Actually, let me make make the the length even the same. This one does what, and this one does what. This creates an array object. This creates an array object. Both are length five, but this one does what, and this one does what. Is line 12 with uh, holding five positions with numbers in it, and then line 16 is five empty positions? No, it's not five empty positions, no. What, zeros? Zeros, yeah. This one puts zeros in the array. When you don't say what numbers to put in the array, you get zeros. So this creates five slots with zero in them, and this creates five slots with the numbers I chose in them. Okay, and if we, we visualize it. Okay. 
The first one, I get to choose what's in the slots by you know listing the numbers I want in there. See, this one puts zeros in there. Why does Java give you this and this? If this is so, yeah, this one lets you choose the numbers. Why don't you always just choose the numbers? Why does Java need both of these? Why not just get rid of one? You know, the more you have, the more confusing things are. Why not just get rid of this and just have this? Um, sometimes you don't know what the numbers are. Well, you could just you put them. If you don't know what the numbers are, you just put zeros yourself. You just go zero, 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 zero. If you don't know what they need to be, you can just do what this does, make them all zero. But what? why does Java need both of these? Because you might have a lot of, um, you, you might have a big number that yeah. you can enter it by your own. Like, suppose I want an array of 5,000 numbers. That's real easy. Oh, it's taking a long time to do it. It's it's working hard at creating my 5,000 numbers. Probably 5,000 was asking a little bit too much. Okay, let's back up. Let's see if we can make it just 500 numbers. But notice that, you know, why do I want that notation? Because I really don't want to do this by hand. There's 500 numbers. Okay. If we only had this notation and you needed an array of 500 numbers, you'd have to type all 500 numbers out. Okay. But Java, so you, you get this one that has the advantage that you can have arbitrary sizes, but it's all filled with zero. And you have this one that lets you pick what numbers you want, but it's it's kind of limited into how many numbers you're willing to sit there and type. Yeah, you know, you're probably not willing to sit there and type a thousand numbers or a couple hundred numbers. Okay, so Java gives you two choices. You could use the one that automatically fills the array with zeros, but you can do it as big as you any size you want, or you can choose the numbers yourself to put in the array. And people rarely use this with anything more than about 10 or 12 numbers. You know, usually when people are using this notation, it's, it's, they're not very big arrays. So it's used when you have just a small number of numbers. I mean, you could type this with a thousand numbers. It would take up pages of, of you know, you'd, you'd have to type, to type thousands of numbers. You'd need pages or, you know, this, like we see over here, how, like how it took, there's 500 zeros. When you fill it, when you do this and you fill it with zeros, then you usually need a loop to go in and put something else in there afterwards. Like if you need an array of size 500, you can you can create 500 holding zeros, but then you then you might need a loop to go back in and replace these numbers either with random numbers or with some other thing. Maybe you have a formula that generates the numbers. Okay, so this will let you have any size array. This will this will let you have this will let you have any size array also but there's a limit to how many numbers you could type, okay? So, now what we're doing here is we're really paying attention to what these lines of code do. Yeah, you know, what we, we, we really need to pay attention to the reference variable versus the object versus the arrow. This one uses uh, an arrow to that same object this one says no arrow. This one puts an arrow to that object and that object just holds zeros, okay? Now, now let's start playing around with doing this ink array. And let's see what that has to do with what we've just been talking about, okay? So 
I can call this array, this method, ink array in place on the array A. Okay, notice that this thing doesn't return anything. So I don't need to put anything on the left-hand side. There is no return value. So I just call this method, and what I expect it to do is take all the numbers in A and add one to them. So it'll, it'll update the very, what's in the, the array A. So let's go ahead and watch that. Okay. Okay, so create, create our arrays. Okay, now I'm about to call this method. Okay, notice I've got an argument to the function call. The argument is this A. The argument is not the array. The argument is A, okay? So what that's gonna do is it's gonna copy what's in A into the parameter down here. It's gonna copy what's in A into the parameter. But that's exactly like what I did here when I copied A into B. And that just gave me another arrow pointing at this guy. So when I call this method, I get the exact same thing, another arrow pointing at this guy. Notice that calling the method was a lot like this. It didn't create an object. It, this, it created a new reference variable and made that reference variable point at the same object. It just copied the arrow from A into B. The arrow from A was copied into B, and now the arrow from A is copied into input array. Notice that the argument is not the array. This is real important. The argument is not an array. The argument's a reference to an array. You don't actually copy arrays. You only copy reference variables. So when I called this method, I copied the arrow from here into here. I copied that arrow into that arrow, but I'm still looking at the same array. There's only one array. Just like this line here didn't create a new array. This method call doesn't create a new array either. So that's why, you know, notice that it's real important to realize that how this method call is acting a lot like that line of code there. Okay, it's acting a lot like that line of code where I've got two reference variables and I just made the arrow in this reference variable copied it into that reference variable. Now I've got two reference variables, that one, and this one, the argument and the parameter, and I'm gonna copy what's in the argument, which is an arrow, into the parameter, and which that means I copied that arrow into that arrow. I'm not copying the array. And that's actually what I want, because now when I loop through here, I'm gonna start modifying this array. See, input array in the method points to that array. That's still the array we were looking at up here. And now I'm gonna loop through it and start, I'm gonna make 2.3 become 3.3. I'm gonna make 4.6 become 5.6. So I'm gonna loop through there and see, I just changed 2.3 to 3.3. Now I'm gonna change 4.6 to 5.6. Notice I'm, I'm, I'm halfway through this array and I'm modifying the array itself, okay? I just modified the last entry. So now I is five. There's no fifth entry over here. So I is five. So that means I'm about to drop out of this loop. This is false now. So when I drop out of this loop, I'm going to return nothing. Okay. Notice I'm about to return. And I don't return anything because here's my answer. My answer is right in there. My answer was I changed what's in the array. So I have nothing to return. So now I go back up here and I'm up here now and this array has been changed. Okay, so that array got changed. All right, now let's go look at another one of the, let's look at what this one would do. Okay, if I call this method, I'm going to call it on uh, E. I've got an array E. I'll call it on E. Now, 
this array, this method returns something. So I should get the return value. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say double um, F. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Now, this line of code, it's kind of like something we did up here. Okay. Notice that we're creating a new reference variable. See, we're creating a new reference variable. Okay. And that reference variable is going to get an arrow put in it. And the arrow put into it is the return arrow from this guy here. This guy is going to return an arrow, and that arrow will be put into here. Okay. And what it's going to be is that this guy is going to create a new array. It's going to read this array make an array, a second array the same size as this array, copy every number from this array into the new array, but add one to them, and then return an arrow to that new array. And that F will end up holding the arrow to the new array. So look at the code down here, okay? Inc array will take in a pointer, a reference to this array. The first thing it does is it makes a new array called output array that's the same length as the input array. So it creates a new array. Then it's going to iterate through the input array, and it's going to read the input array, add one to it, and write the answer in the output array. Notice that it reads from a slot i and writes the slot i. But it's reading in the input array, adding one, and writing to slot i in the output array. Then when we're done, we return a reference to the output array. Okay, so let's watch that happen. There's a lot going on here. Yeah, we, this is a reference to the input array. We make a new array that's the same size as this one. We copy data from the new, from the input array to the new array. Then we return a reference to the new array and that reference ends up over here in F. Okay, let's watch it all happen. Okay, let me step through this part here. Okay, let me step through the call to ink array in place. Okay, now I'm here. Okay, now I'm gonna do something like we did here. When I call this method, I'm gonna, this is the argument. You can't really see everything here. There's not much room here, but this is the argument. There's the parameter. That argument here is going to get passed to that parameter there. So we're going to have this variable pointing at the same array that this one does. So again, that's a lot like this line of code here again. We're passing an arrow. We're not copying an array. Okay. So then we're down in here, and this is pointing to that array there. Going to be pointing to that array there. Then we'll see a new array get created with the name output array. So let me start. Well, actually, let me go ahead and start stepping through this. So, okay, we're in ink array. The input parameter points at the same variable that the argument pointed at. So it notes that the input parameter points at the same array that the argument pointed at. So we copied the arrow from that argument into that parameter, okay? All right, so now the next thing to do is create a new array called output array. Okay, same length as the input array. So there's the input array. There's the, this is the one we're calling input array. This is the one we're calling output array. Now we're going to step through the input array and add one to every number in here and put it down here. So this will end up being one, 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 one. Okay. Now I'm going to start stepping through it. Okay. So I'm going to read this zero, add one to it, and write the result there. Okay. Now I'm going to step through the next entry in the array. So I'm at entry one now. So I'm at this entry in the array. I'm going to read that number. 
read the input array, add one to it, and put the result in the output array. Okay, so that I read zero, added one, and it moved it down here. And then I'm ready to increment to the slot two array. So now I'm doing the slot two. Same thing, I'll just start stepping through. Okay, now I is five. There is no fifth entry. So this test is gonna fail. So I'm gonna drop out of the loop. So when I drop out of the loop, I go to this line 55. Okay, now I'm about to return this, I'm not going to return this array. I'm going to return this arrow to the array. Okay, this is a lot like what we did up here. That, like, again, it's, it, it really is based, it's this line of code is what we're doing over and over again. This line of code put the arrow in A into B. It didn't do anything to the object. It put the arrow from A into B. When we get to this line of code down here, when we re Turn that reference variable, we're going to see Java will show it. See, we're going to return that arrow. That arrow is the arrow that's in output array. We're going to return that arrow and we're going to return it to the variable f, which doesn't exist down here yet, but it's going to be the variable f that's going to, we're going to copy that arrow into f. So f's going to point at that array. Notice that we're not really returning the array we're returning a reference that happens to point to that array. So it's it's copying arrows, not copying arrays. So I do one more click here. Now, this is the Java Visualizer screwing up here. See this array? It disappears on us. It shouldn't disappear. It's sitting there still. That array is still sitting there, but the Java Visualizer hasn't, see, we've just done the right-hand side. Now it has to do the left-hand side, which is this, remember we said that these things have three multiple steps to them. The visualizer sees this as three steps. Step one is call this a method. Step two is create this a variable. Step three is copy the return value into the reference variable. Copy what this thing returned into that reference variable. Right now, we're sort of in the middle. We've called this method, which created an array that's sitting here. The F hasn't been created yet. When I click forward, the F will be created. Then it can put the arrow in F pointing into that array. Then that array reappears. And this is just a mistake on that part. This array should be sitting here with no arrow pointing to it because it's about to get the arrow from F to it. See, now the array reappeared. It's a real goofy thing on their part to make that array disappear. Yeah, you know, I'm sure at some point they're going to fix this. I mean, I mean this, the Java Visualizer is a pretty new thing. It's a new tool for teaching Java, but it's there's the people who wrote it are still working on it. And this is one kind of glaring little problem they have is that when you have when you have this picture, you're going to return a reference to that array. The array disappears for an instant. It should not have disappeared. It's really there, but the array appears to disappear. So okay, we've we've now returned from calling, we're doing the right-hand side of this line. Now we're gonna do the left-hand side of this line. Oh, if we go back, notice that we're returning to line 19. So you remember this thing tells us we're gonna to return to line 19. Yeah, that's this line up here. And you'll see that's exactly what we do. We return to line, we return to line 19. See, we return to line 19 because we still have to do the left-hand side of line 19. We've done the right-hand side. Now we need to return and finish the left-hand side, but they make the array disappear for a brief minute. Then you click one more forward button. Now you've finished the left-hand side and the equal sign and that array appears there, okay? Right, so notice that we returned a reference to that array. So F is holding a reference to what, now this array is the incrementing of everything that was in that array, okay? All right, now let's look at the third one. The third one of these methods is a little bit different still, okay? Okay, watch what's gonna happen now. I'm gonna use the third one now, ink array chain. So I'm gonna do the following. Ink array chain. 
And I'll do this one on, I'll, I'll do it on A again. I'll use A as the input. But ink array chain returns, like the previous one, a reference variable. Okay, so that means I should capture the result return value. So I'll say double a ref, no, I want a reference variable to hold the arrow that's returned, and I'll call it G. Okay, so this guy is going to return an arrow, and that arrow is going to be put in G. Okay, and we'll see what it's an arrow to. This guy does not create a new array. He acts like ink array in place. He's going to do the incrementing right inside of the array pointed to by A. But then it's going to return an arrow to A. So the G is going to end up being another arrow back to this array here. This array is, yeah, this array got updated here. Now this array is going to get updated again here. And this is going to end up being another arrow to that array. We'll see why we would want to do that. Why would we want another arrow to that array? We'll see in a minute. Okay. So go through the visualizing again. Taking a long time. Okay, let's see. I think it's I, it, I think it might well, let's try it again let's see if it it might have just been no oh see now this thing is their their servers kind of crashed on us so what i'm going to do is make a copy of this i'll just open another tab to the java visualizer Okay, and try it again. Okay, this one kind of somehow, this one, notice that this one, that button's grayed out. This one's kind of lost. If I if I just refresh this screen, I lose all my code. One of the, another slight disadvantage of Java Visualizer, well, I can show you. If I refresh the screen, see, I lost all my code. So it's dangerous to refresh the screen. You gotta remember to make a copy of your code before you refresh the screen. So, I mean, I have a copy there, okay? Now, so actually, I don't even need this window now. I can just go back here. So I got my copy in there. Let's see if it works a second time. Let's try it again. Yeah, see, this time it worked. So their server, their server burped on the last one. The server had a problem. And the, the trouble is when their server has a problem, what you really wanna do is make a copy of your code and re then refresh the screen or open a new tab. Yeah, it might be safer just to open a new tab so you don't lose the code that was in the other tab. But the Java Visualizer, every once in a while, especially during the day, if there's a lot of people using it, their server will, will hiccup and, and something will go wrong, okay? Now, this line of code, we, we, know what, we know what these lines of code do here, okay? So let me just step through them quickly. Create the array, create the, some references, do the ink array in place. So we're going to increment this one in place. Okay. So this one got incremented in place. Now we're going to make, now we're going to increment this one, but in a copy. So this one will increment E in a copy. There's the copy. Now we increment into the copy. Okay. Done. Okay. So there's, the copy, we incremented into the copy. So ink array of E, put the answers in F. Okay, now what about this one, about the chaining one? Okay, I said that this one acts like ink array in place. And if we go look at the code, ink array chain, see, it, it modifies its input array. Here's the reference to the input array. It loops through that array and just increments whatever's in the array. That's exactly like ink array in place. See, it's the exact same loop there, okay? So this one does the exact same thing. There's that exact same loop, but after it does the looping, so let's go through it. So now we're going to increment this thing in place. So this will be 4.3, 6.6, negative 1.1. So I'm gonna increment that into place.
Okay, so I've incremented the whole array. I'm about to drop out, I'm at index five, doesn't exist. So I'm about to drop out of this array and go to line 80. Now I'm gonna return a reference to that array. The array I just modified, I'm gonna return a reference to it. Okay, so then when I return, see I'm gonna return a reference to the array. That, so this was the, notice that the input array is what I'm returning a reference to. I'm just returning a reference to what was my input array. And now G points to that array. So now I've got another reference to that same array. Now I've got A, B, and G all pointing to that array. Okay, now why would I want to do this? Why would I want to have something that's almost exactly like ink array in place but it does ink array chain, okay? And let me show you, the key is, what if I want to do multiple increments? Okay, so watch, here's what I mean by that, okay? So I'm gonna create a, I'm gonna just start with a new array. I'm gonna do, uh, I'm gonna call this A1 equals, I'll just create a new array. And I want to increment it two times, okay? This will be the result of incrementing it one time. And I'm going to increment it using this one that gives me a new array. And then I want to increment it a second time. That was supposed to be a second variable and then a third variable. Okay, now if I want, now look at, this is my original array. I increment it once and here's the result. What do I put here if I want to increment the array a second time? A2. A2, because I want to increment the thing that's been incremented. So I want to now increment the thing that holds the incremented version of this. Okay. Right. Okay. Now, this can be shortened to one line of code. I want to ink array, I want to increment, notice what I did here. A3 is the incrementing of the result of incrementing A1. So another way to do these two lines of code here in one line would be this. See, this line abbreviates the previous two lines. Okay, so it's the same thing as the previous two lines, okay? Right, so this is what we call composing functions or chaining functions. Ink array of, ink array of A1. So that gives me two increments, okay? The ink of the ink of that array. So A4 and A3 hold the same thing. A2 holds one increment of A1. Now, notice that when I do this, when I do it this way, I don't have access to that intermediary array. So this thing returned an array holding one increment of A1, which is immediately sent to this array, and then it returns the array that holds the second increment. That would be this guy here. Here we're gonna see this holds one increment and this holds two increments. This one just holds two increments, okay? Now before running that, let's think about doing the same thing using ink array in place, okay? 
If I'm going to use ink array in place, I do the following. That increments A1 once, right? What does that do? What do these two lines do together? They increment A1 twice. They increment A1 twice, which is the same thing we did here, except over here, we didn't change A1. We said increment A1 once and put it in the result over here, then increment that result another time and put the result here. And here we did the same thing again. Take A1, increment it once, and put the results in a separate array, then pass that array to ink again and get another array. Here we're saying, take this guy and increment him in place. So all the numbers in A have been changed by one. Then do it again, so this increments twice, okay? Can I abbreviate this in one line of code? Does that work? It worked here. Does it work here? Re now, how do you study, how do you answer a question like this? You read the code carefully, very, very carefully. Okay, so read this line here. Okay, you always start with what's inside the parentheses. Okay, you always do things from parentheses from inside out. So here's a pair of parentheses. You do what's inside them first. So you do this first. Okay, so to understand line 29, you start with this. Now, what does that do? This, um, this does not return any, anything. Okay, but yeah, what does it do? And what doesn't it do? What does it do? It, what does? Hmm? Um, it increments A1, but yeah. it does not return a reference. Right. What it does do is it increments A1. It so it adds one to every number in it. What it doesn't do is give us a reference back. See, it gives us void back. But what does this thing want as input? This thing wants as input a reference. Notice that that doesn't, they don't, they don't combine together. This thing takes as input a reference and it gives us back nothing. But then when we compose it with this guy, this guy wants a reference as input. So the compiler is gonna complain and say, you can't do that, watch. The compiler is going to complain. Void type not allowed here. Now, here's what's here mean. Well, when you click OK, you find out here meant right here. Void type is not allowed there. The method ink array in place cannot take void as the input because void means nothing. So that would mean there's no the ink array in place needs a reference. Now, see, we that's why we keep emphasizing the difference between references and objects. This method takes as input a reference and it returns nothing. When we try to compose it, okay, there's the reference as input, but the output, there's there's no output for this guy to take as input. We cannot compose this function. So that line of code isn't allowed, okay? But now, let me try another thing. Mm -hmm. 
this takes that array and increments it, just like ink array and place did. Okay, and then this would increment it again. See, this would increment it and put the results in A1, and this would increment it and put the results in A1. Okay, just like these two lines of code did. But the thing is, I can I can compose these two. I can do the following. That's allowed. Why? Because it returns uh, another array back. It doesn't just. Well, return it doesn't point. return an array. It returns what? Reference. Yeah. See, that's it. It returned it. It returned the reference that this one needs as its input. This one returned an array reference that this one needed as its input. Now, what's it returning in a reference to? It takes A1 as input, modifies it in place, returns a reference to what? Array. What array? Double array. Um, what double array? Um, it increments A1. It, the incremented A1. It just returns a reference to the same array again. It just returns another reference to that array, but then that can go into here and then it can increment the array a second time. Okay, so here's something you, you may have, some of you might be in the calculus class, okay? And you've seen things like the drip that you've seen the chain rule. Okay, you have this chain rule. Okay, the chain rule is the rule for when you're taking the derivative of a function of a function. You know, it's it, another way to write the chain rule. This is this is one way to write the chain rule. The other way to write the chain rule is see if somebody wrote it the other way. Um, this way. See this one? F of G of X. Outer function, inner function. The derivative of an outer function, an inner function. That's called chaining. An outer function of an inner function. That's why this thing's called the chain rule. So over here, this is ink array chain lets me chain the functions outer function inner function this one also lets me have outer function inner function that's a chaining of methods okay so the word chain here is just like the word chain in the chain rule it has to do when you have an outer function and an inner function with the fancy word for that is composition so here's written bigger that's a composition of functions an outer function with an inner function Okay, well, we have the same idea in programming. We have function of function of something. That means take this, make it input to that function, then take the output of that function and make it the input of that function, then the output of that function gets stored in that variable. Here, I'm taking, this is the input to that function. The output of that function goes into that function. And then, but I don't need to capture the result here because the result is actually still held in A1. Okay, now this one, ink array in place, couldn't be chained. Ink array in place cannot be chained because it returns void. Okay, this is subtle, it's, it's subtle stuff. It, 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 it's not easy. It takes real effort to go through and understand these differences. But what we're seeing is, different ways to write the code that people people use these different techniques in their programming. It's not at all uncommon to people write something like this, a, a version that can't be chained and a version that can be chained. This guy, by definition, can be chained because his input looks just like his output. 
So he, so he automatically can be chained because what he takes as input is what he returns as output. That's automatic. And now this one can be chained also because what he takes as input is what he returns as output. But this one's weird because what it's doing is it's modifying that input array and then the output reference just points right back at the input array. Whereas this one created a new array. So it took that input array and left it alone. Didn't touch it really, didn't modify it. It only read it, didn't write anything into it. All the writing happened in the output array, okay? So this changes its input array. This one changes the input array. This one does not change the input array. It writes all the changes into the output array. Sometimes that's the better way to do things so that you preserve the input array without making any changes into it. Sometimes you don't mind clobbering the input array. Sometimes you don't want to clobber the input array. You want to keep it intact and you want all the changes to be in a second array. So they're slightly different things. One, one clobbers the input numbers and replaces them with output numbers. The other one keeps the input array alone, keeps it safe and puts all the, the new numbers in a separate array, okay? And then this one acts like this one, but it has this little trick that because it returns a reference to the input array can be chained, okay? Now let's watch it. Let's, we can now watch this all happen. Uh, okay, fine, it came through. Oh, we exceeded the time limit. Uh, we're doing a lot of, let's see. Let me, okay. To save steps, right now I'm not using that those two lines of code. I'm not using those two lines of code. So I'm gonna comment out the lines of code that we're not really using. And we're not really using those two. So we're we're really just using this code here. We're we're watching this code here take place. So hopefully, if I comment out these these things, th I'll be able to run all of these. So this is inking the array twice, where there's the input, there's the output. Pass the input output back. Pass the output right back as input to ink array and get the result or do it all in one line. Here, increment A once, increment it again, but we cannot chain this one. And then here, increment A once, increment it again, but we could abbreviate that into this line here. Okay, in fact, we don't, well, yeah, let's go ahead and see if, see if it, it'll step through all those steps. Yeah, see, I didn't, I didn't exceed their, uh, I didn't get that error message down here. So now it'll step, it'll do all the steps we want. Okay, so create this array called A1. Okay, now call ink array. So we're in ink array with a reference to A1. See, A1 got copied to there. So we're reading that, now we're reading that array. What we're gonna do is create an output array and we're going to increment into the output array. So increment into the output array. Okay, so everything's been incremented. Now, this guy didn't get touched. All the results are in the output array. Okay, so now we can return a reference to the output array that holds the increments. So return that. Okay, now A2 holds the incremented. So A1 got incremented into this array A2. Now we're gonna call ink array again with A2, okay? So now we're in ink array. Now we're pointing at A2. Create a third array to hold the increments of these guys. Step through, increment those guys. Okay, so now this has been incremented into this array. Now we can return, we can return the result, the incremented increment. So that was the original array, increment it once, increment it twice, return a reference to this guy. Okay, 
So now A3 holds the two increments of A1. Now, this is going to be weird. Watch the abbreviated version. What's going to happen, it's going to be, it's a little bit confusing. We're going to enter the array, this function with a reference to A1. This guy will make a copy and he'll do the results in the copy. Then the copy will be passed to another call to ink array. So we'll just go from one call to ink array directly into another call to ink array. So kind of watch what happens here. Okay. We're now in ink array pointing back at A1. So we're starting over from beginning. And there's our new array that we're going to increment this guy into that guy. So increment into there. Okay. We've incremented this one into this one. Okay. We're about to return. Okay, now here's the tricky part. We're returning to line 25. Go back up here and look at line 25. We're returning from this call right back to that call. So when we return to line 25, this output array will become the new input array. This output array from this call will become the input array to that call. So remember that the array is 22446677. So it's going to disappear briefly, but remember that the array we're interested in, this, the output array from this call becomes the input array to this call. So remember it's 22446667. So click forward. We're going to do, we're going to return to line 25. Okay, we return to line 25. The array we're interested in disappeared briefly. Now it's going to reappear as the input array to a call to ink array. Okay, so there's another call to ink array. What's its input? 22446677. Okay, so the output from, go back to line 25, the output from him became the input to him. Okay, now here's the input array. So we make a copy. Now we're going to increment this guy into this guy. So there's three, two, five, four, seven, six, eight, seven. Okay, now this is the increment of the increment of this guy up here. Okay, now something's gonna funny is gonna happen. When we return to line 25 again, see, so notice we're returning to line 25 again, but now we're returning not in the middle here, we're returning to this part here, we're returning to that. Both of these arrays are going to disappear. Now, this one really does disappear. The input array here was the output from this one, which was the input from this one, is no longer needed. That's this temporary array A2. This array really will disappear, but this is the array that's going to be the answer A4. So you'll see the 22446677 completely disappears this one will disappear then reappear so remember three two five four seven six eight seven this one will re oh, it's just, and it's gonna be a see it's the same thing as this one this one will reappear a after they both disappear this one will stay disappeared this one will reappear so we're about to return this guy we're going to return to line 25 see we're back to line 25 we're now doing this part of line 25. There's that array that was the return array from this guy. He's now there. And the return array from this guy really disappears because there's no need for it anymore. The output from this one, which was the input from this one, is not needed anymore. So it's actually gone. Okay. All right. Okay. So now. Real quick, this one's just going to increment this array in place. So we're incrementing this guy up here now. Okay, so we incremented this guy up here. Now we're going to increment it again. So it's going to go, we're going to increment this one again up here. Three, two, five, four, seven, six, eight, seven. Okay. So 
we did two increments in a row here. And again, this will just do two more increments in a row. So this will go three to four to five. Do one increment. Okay, now do the second increment. Notice on keep incrementing this one up here. Okay, so I did two more increments on this one here. Now, now I can do it with chaining. The big difference between this one and this one is this created a bunch of new arrays down here. It, when we do this chaining here, we're never going to create new arrays. Everything's happening on this guy here. Everything happens on this guy here. We just keep returning more pointers to him. So when this one does all its incrementing on here, it'll just pass an array, a reference to this one, still to there. So all both these calls to ink array will just keep incrementing that guy there. So watch, just last thing. We'll, first, we're going to do the inner one. See, now we're at line 33. We're going to do the inner one here. See, we came from line 33, and we're doing the inner increment. Five to seven, 10, 11. Okay, now we're about to return a pointer to that same guy. Now we're about to do this one with a pointer to that guy again. So we're still pointing to that same one and we just keep incrementing it. Okay, and we're done. And we've incremented this one. We incremented this one one, two, three, four times. All of these increments happened on that one there. Okay. Notice it's it's a lot of ideas. These four, we didn't even get to this third, this fourth one. There's so many ideas in those three little declarations there. No, so these are just the declarations, but there's so many ideas in there of incrementing an array in place, taking that input array and making modifications to it, and then not returning anything. Taking this input array, making a copy of it, and then returning, making the changes in the copy and return a reference to the copy. Then this one takes in an input array, makes the changes in the input array, but then just to make chaining work, it returns a reference to that input array. So it turns a reference to the array that the changes were made in. And that's only so that you can do this chaining if you want to. You can do ink array of ink array instead of doing ink array, ink array. Instead of doing it sequentially like this, you can chain them. Okay. Yeah. Just like here, I could do this sequentially or I could chain it. Here, I could do things sequentially but I am not allowed to chain it because this one returns in void. A lot of ideas. I mean, I, it is a lot of ideas, that, but these ideas are gonna keep coming up. You're gonna see them over and over again, as, especially like when you get to data structures class. These ideas will constantly be there. These examples are really good examples to go back to. Later on, as you keep digging into this stuff, these examples, I wrote them because I know from my own experience that it's they're, they're really good examples to go back to. You keep going back to these simple examples to understand how more complicated examples are working. Okay, so we've run out of time. So uh, remember, look at, look, if you haven't already, look, look at your exam one score and exam two score, and, and don't just look at the score, look at the exams itself. And if you have questions about anything about the exams, please send me an email and ask. Otherwise, you know, we'll meet again, or we're going to start talking about, when we meet again, we're going to start talking about classes and objects. And meantime, we, we meet again in a week from now, and have a nice Thanksgiving. I hope you enjoy Thanksgiving. And we'll end there, and see you in one week. Bye.